This is Coda Radio, episode 61, for August 5th, 2013. everyone, you're listening to Coder Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and related technologies. This episode is brought to you by our two fine sponsors, GoDaddy.com and Unity Sync by Directory Wizards. I'll tell you more about both those as the show goes on. This episode was live on a Monday morning. My name is Chris and joining us every single week is the always excellent Mr. Michael Dominic. Hey there, Michael. Wouldn't always angry be more... Uh honest these days <laughs> yeah well just just been a just been a rough couple months man let me tell you uh it's uh, uh you know i'm not complaining i mean i love that i have a brand new baby daughter but i am there right there with you man i am right there with you it has been yes. rough it has been tough i think that might be the topic of today's episode actually yeah, but should we get to a sponsor first i want i'm really excited so uh, we got a couple of emails now i'm going to be honest before we get to the emails chris picked them out this week that's me and they might not be as of the usual caliber that Mr. Dominic would pick, but you guys have to bear with me. But first, before we get into our email, we don't normally do a sponsor this early in the show, but I'm really excited to have a new sponsor with the Coda Radio program, and that is Directory Wizards Unity Sync. Now, have you heard of Unity Sync, Mr. Dominic? Because I can tell you all about it. I would Honestly, love to tell Honestly, I have not. <clears throat> all right. Well, you might be thinking of that desktop software, you know, that that canonical company makes. You might be thinking of that 3D gaming software that, that those Unity 3D guys make. No. Unity Sync is it's, it's hipster to those. It's been around way before that. Unity Sync is cool, man. And actually, I think it's a great, uh, I think it might be a great uh, solution for a lot of people in our audience. It saves us, it sort of takes care of this age old problem of moving data between different types of directories and doing it intelligently, maybe against templates or with some scripting. You know, I know you love Perl. Well, guess what? Love Perl. It's got a Perl scripting backend. So I'll give you an example. Uh, have you ever had a client that has uh, that's been that's purchased another uh, company or they're merging something like that? I, I know I have. I've run into this yeah. where two companies have have got two different types of directories. Maybe it's Active Directory and a, and a Novell E Directory, or maybe it's oh, an Open gosh. LDAP and an Exchange. Yeah. You know, or Microsoft SQL and a Zimbra uh, Contacts database. And you want to try to bring these two things into synchronization. Or maybe you've got one application that's got a directory that writes to uh, one it, its own database. And you want to pull out certain elements like phone numbers or last names or, or departments or, or whatever the field is that your application needs. A, a, a Unity Sync can sit between these two directories and manage that for you. It sort of, saves, sort of solves this age-old IT problem of syncing between multiple directories. You can kind of achieve that mythical global address list by synchronizing multiple directories in a company. So maybe you've got two different types of uh, directories for some particular reason for staff and phone numbers. This can bring those two things into sync. It could also just be used to pull out elements in a read-only fashion and store them in another directory. Uh, anything that's LDAP-based, SQL, text, even group-wise, which is just absolutely awesome. Uh, it's used by tons of big companies like the NFL, Anheuser-Busch, more. Go to derwiz.com. And go check out Unity Sync. It is really something. And they've just uh, recently, not too long ago, got a Linux version under five megabytes. Enterprise grade software under five okay. megabytes. That's that's some tight code. I'll tell you what else is really cool is uh, Derwiz is giving out an extended trial for you business types out there that want to try this out. Go over to derwiz.com slash download. Choose Unity Sync. And you probably want to choose that Linux version. Uh, maybe you got a Windows box around. <laughs> maybe, right? <laughs> right, right. So download that, then put in the code CODER for the promo code. CODER. You know what you get? An extended trial and your first year of maintenance for free. So nice. try it out. Then when you decide to pull that trigger, they're going to take care of you for a year. Isn't that awesome? I'm almost sold, but you know, I've been using this platform. Um, you might have heard of it, Prism. <laughs> now, now, what kind of... Um, you know, well, API hooks into Prism of my offer. So, uh, hoping, I'm hoping, uh, I put, I've sent off a letter that maybe they'll open up the Prism API, and then uh, assuming they're using some sort of LDAP backend. I know that Prism's operating on a cluster of Linux servers. Right. I mean, uh, I'm looking at the, it's got my iMail, my yeah. Zimbra, my Apple yeah. LD, 
you everything know, everything looks good except I don't see Prism. As long as the NSA is using Oracle, Sybase, MySQL, Microsoft SQL, heck, even Microsoft Access. I mean, if they're storing all that Microsoft Access, Unity Sync can pull it from that and put it into right. any directory you want. And let me tell you something. I'll tell you. I'll get. I'll sell it for you, Mr. Dominic. You know what show they're not sponsoring this month? The Linux Action Show. You know why? Yes. They're throwing oh. down the Unity Sync by Directory Wizards is throwing down the gauntlet and saying, boom, we know the Coda Radio audience is hardcore. So if you guys are advocates of the oh. Coda Radio program, go over to derwiz.com and go to download. Check out Unity Sync. See what it can do. Put in that code Coda and let them know you appreciate them sponsoring the Coda Radio program. Screw those Linux guys. Damn hippies. Uh, can I just take one small tangent? Yeah. This looks awesome. I know. It really is. I've also, I, I found a new sales method. Oh, yeah? So I've requested um, access to Prism, and I'm cold calling people from it. Because <laughs> think about it. You know everything about the lead. <laughs> I see you saw Superman yeah, last right, week. Yeah, right, exactly. Well, you know what you could do is you could play it smooth, too, and be like, hi there, I know uh, you like Superman, so do I. So, uh... <laughs> I kid about the Derwiz thing. He'll probably be on Linux Action Show next month, but this Don't is your do chance. This is a... Um, Listen, those Linux hippies don't want to spend money. This is your chance. This is your chance. People who buy Macs are crazy, and they love to spend money. Oh, wait, are you assuming Coda Radio wants is Mac users? Because I think that might not necessarily be the case at all. Judging from the hate mail, I'm going to yeah. go with no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but uh, it is pretty cool, and it's cool that he's in the chat room, too. And I'm not saying he's going to offer tech support in the chat room, but if you guys have questions for him and you catch him while he's in there and he's in a good mood, he'll now probably answer any questions. Now, how oh. cool is that? So anyways, all right. So uh, go check out uh, dirtwiz.com and uh, Unity Sync. Unity Sync is really cool, man. Now, if I would have had that back in the day, whoo You know, actually, a few years ago, I had to do something with syncing up an Exchange server to something that wasn't Exchange. Nightmare. Yeah. 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 The, 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 it's whatever the fee for, for, for Sync is, it's probably... Well worth it's it. awesome too because yeah. it's got it's not only does it have intelligence but it can also be really it can be really clever about like uh you know you can recognize like just the phone number in there and grab just that and move it over to a different director you know anything like that where you can be really you can grab you can grab the whole dang thing or just the specific attribute it's really awesome anything to abstract away exchange would be awesome all right, so I want to get to a couple of emails that I picked out real quick this one came in from Timothy and he says Michael I really enjoy your show Coda radio Funny thing is, I can't code, but I want to learn. What draws me in, though, is your perspective and independent, self-employed, and entrepreneurialness. On my, on to my question, he says. I think he just wanted to give you a little internet hug right there. Well, he's, he's brown nosing because he knows I might yell at him. Well, you need it, man. You need it today. Yeah. You, uh, yeah. All right. I'm a physician, <clears throat> and I currently uh, make about 200 ultrasound reports a month. This is extra work outside my day job and needs to be done efficiently. As I read and study, I keep a database on paper. Oh, wow. Of patient demographics and, te and test specifics, plus about 12 velocity measurements and some standard findings. Then I type that data into a finely tuned word template to create a nice report. The template has a field for patient demos, velocity data, finding, and conclusion. I can do 90% of the reports only using the template. I would like, however, to bring this into the computer. So he goes on to talk about how he wants to set up a LAN on his database. Uh, but what he wants to know is he doesn't know enough about languages to know where to put my energy. For example, I see Python as a template agent engine that sounds right and might work. Before I jump in and learn all this, any advice on where to start specifically? Would be happy to attach a sample template if that would help. Well, that's not necessary. He says something like MS, MS Access could do this, but I prefer to spend the time learning a programming language rather than another application. That's an interesting insight right there, isn't it? Thanks in advance. Yeah. <clears throat> So he wants to know if he if he's just basically got some basic data entry, maybe he wants to generate some reports. I mean, what do you think? Is this a, are you are you seeing a web app when you see this? What are you seeing? I am. Honestly, I'm, I was seeing access. Yeah, I mean I, I yeah. that would probably probably be the most straightforward, but I kind of I kind of see where he's coming from like if, this what maybe a little VB script, but if he doesn't want to go that route, I yeah. mean a simple a simple win forms app because you could do it in C sharp. Or what about like a PHP web app? Well, the problem is if he puts it on the web... Uh, well, not only you know, local on the LAN. You know, like he was saying, it would yeah. only be on the LAN. He wouldn't actually put it on the web. He'd put it on a okay. local LAMP server. Because see, what I'm digging about that, now this is just me, but I'm thinking maybe this would be something that more than one person could take advantage of in the company. Maybe it could be used on a mobile device, so he could do. He could be on a tablet, and he could be an iPad or Android. True. I mean, as, as the ever-cautious Zane Swafford writes, uh, always check HIPAA. I'm not sure what kind of data this is, so I'd be very nervous about putting it anywhere. Right, right, right. That's a good yeah, point. I mean, I mean, you know, you could do, a, I guess, a local host kind of thing on your own machine, just, you know, not PHP. Um, <laughs> okay, 
<laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. It's not PHP. No, but in all seriousness, he could write a very simple C sharp or Java, uh, you know, desktop app to do this. Yeah. Or he, or he could even. <clears throat> I mean, he, the thing is, he doesn't even need like a full API, so he doesn't even need something as heavy as Java Play or anything like that. Right. Huh. Uh, you you could write this in almost anything if you don't care about the platform. It's interesting because my approach would be I, I just outsource it to a contractor to write this for me. <laughs> That's well, where so I'm at these th- days. Th- this wouldn't be very expensive to contract out either. Right, right. And, you know, or, I mean, maybe that is one way to go is to have a contractor sort of... Would you recommend starting it yourself and then handing it off to a contractor? Or would you recommend maybe having a contractor sort of build no, it up for you? No, 90% of the time the contractor is going to refuse to take what you've started. Ah, yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, Because he can't guarantee timeframes and things like that. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, Vlad writes in, he says, Hello, friends, I was listening to Coda Radio 60, where Mr. Dominic says that Unity is only for 3D. But I was searching around, and I found this, and he links this to uh, a toolkit for uh, 2D programming with Unity. I have a question. I know, uh, oh, by the way, the reason why I wanted to read that is because we got that from a few folks. Uh, I said, I have a question. I know Perl and some C Sharp. I want to take a look at Unity. Do I have to know math and, or graphics design in order to use 3D games, to program 3D games in Unity? Thanks, Vlad. All right, so Unity is designed for 3D games, right? There are ways to use it for 2D games, but it, at its core, it is intended for 3D games. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, exactly. It's we always we always want to use the tool for about, the right thing. Yeah, and I think we talked about this last episode. Mm-hmm. Not saying you couldn't do it. I know lots of people have with great success, but it's not the intention. So when the folks over at Unity are designing updates to the tools, they're generally thinking about 3D games. Um, you're not to say you're not a first class citizen. It's just you're using the tool in a way that it wasn't intended for. Hey, would you be more worried about something them changing, them changing something sort of like? No, I'm just, I'm just, you know, if you're going to do a 2D game, why not pick something that's optimized for that? Right. I mean, I'm doing something in Coco's 2DX because it's, you know, a 2D engine is optimized for mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Now, having said that, the graphics artist I'm working with is drooling over Unity. Uh, he literally comes to my house once a week and asks me about it. <laughs> because, as the email suggests, it's very designer-friendly. <clears throat> yeah. It makes importing things from Photoshop, from, I think, Maya and 3DS Max. I'm not sure about Maya, but definitely 3DS Max. Really easy. Isn't there sort of, like, also it's it's taking yeah. off, so there's sort of an incentive to learn it because it's a very employable skill. It's also very easy as a as a whole concept. You go to their website, they've got it all listed out for you, all labeled. Well, it, it's very easy to understand. It's a very, it, there's a big community around it, so it's one of those things where it might be worth it to pick Unity just because if you have a question, there are lots of people on Stack Overflow and the Unity forums who will quickly help you, hmm. rather than rolling your own or picking something a little rarer, right? Right. In terms of knowing math and, and and that sort of thing, for games it always helps, right? Especially if you're doing any kind of physics. I mean, for 2D, you can get pretty far with uh, Box 2D or Chipmunk, but at some point, a little bit of math is going to be is going to go a long way. Okay, so that's the bottom line. That right there is the bottom line. A little bit of math, you're going to have to know a little bit of math. Yeah. Well, that's put. I'm out. I'm out. All right, well, uh, now just to kind of lift your spirits before we get into the heavy stuff, because you and I are about to get into some heavy stuff. Um, i gotta, I got to watch what I say, because the wife might be listening. Uh, anyways, uh, this one came in from Fonzie. He says, uh, hey, Chris and Michael. Hey, no, he says, hey. 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 Uh, it's Fonzie again. Uh, last time on episode 52, I asked about becoming a developer and how to get my feet wet. Well, I listened to Michael's advice on starting a small library, and it turned out Fantastic. Now my internship knows that I can somewhat code, since I told my manager about my small embarrassing libraries, and he'll now be training me to do automated testing with Selenium for the software they write. Uh, just wanted to update, guys, and thank you for the tip. Keep up the great work. Fonzie. Ooh, Selenium. Let me know how that goes for you. So how about that? So uh, that sounds like, a, sounds like a winner tip, uh, starting out. That sounds like a success story. <laughs> when people, uh, people want to start out, maybe start out with libraries. When source is the way to and go, I think man. if I recall, it was like you're sort of creating your own toolbox that you can continue to rely on and draw on for a while. Yeah, well, well, I mean, that's how I, you know, I, I have some someone helping me. I guess we revealed last show Zane is helping me with a few of my internal projects. Um, that's how that's the easiest way to get hired, right? Do something on your own because uh, anyone can lie on a resume, anyone can lie on a CV. Inappropriate. 
How is that inappropriate? <laughs> line on a resume and line on a CV. Oh, that's inappropriate. Yeah, yeah. But here's the other thing: you can graduate <laughs> with a with a decent GPA in computer science, and as recent interviews have shown, not know shit about programming. Hey, oh. Sorry. Ooh. You know, if if we were Jedi, Chris, I think I would have fallen to the dark side. My eyes would be glowing I, yellow. I do think so. Yeah, I do think so. And and was it Apple that tipped it off? Was it Apple that just sort of? I, I think. And this is probably the main show topics. There have been some minor issues with working from the house that have oh my God. kind of been under the surface. But I was always I always had great relationships with clients, so it always kind of balanced out. Oh yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. And then the, this Apple thing happened. And for a day everybody was a little annoyed. Two days, three days, everybody hated me. Right. Yeah. yeah. So now I'm I'm in those phone calls where it's like, well, what do you mean? Right? Because then my personal keys happened to expire during that week, which was awesome. Wow. All right. Hold it right there. And we'll thank our second sponsor for this week. That's an awesome tease, Mr. Dominic. That is GoDaddy.com. GoDaddy.com has got something new, something awesome. Now, I'm not going to say Danica Patrick is our special relationship and contact at GoDaddy who pulls strings for us. But you might notice if you use the link in the Coda Radio show notes now before you buy a .com for $2.49. That's right. We got it for another month. I don't know how. It's awesome. Well, actually, I do know how. And uh, thank you, Danica. I mean, unnamed support person. But if you use that link in our show notes, the Jupiter Broadcasting audience gets something special. You get the new express pathway that GoDaddy's working on. You go there, you buy the .com within a matter of two, three clicks, you're done. It's super simple. GoDaddy knows you guys are experts. So they're not throwing up a bunch of extra add-ons and try to tell you about something that maybe you didn't know existed because you guys already know all of the products. You guys already know what everything does and you're on a specific mission. So now when you want to get a $2.49 domain, if you use that link on our show notes, you also get it in the Super Express Pathway. Check out, ba-boom, nice and quick. A nice clean interface. And uh, we thank GoDaddy for sponsoring the Coda Radio program. And thanks to you guys. Listen, Think about some of the things you can do with a .com for $2.49. You can make a long domain shorter. You can make a project site have a little extra buzz. You can give somebody's wedding invitation its own custom URL. You can have all kinds of... You can have a .com that just forwards to Gmail. That way, if you want to move off Gmail in a year or so, you are not you don't have everybody out there using your Gmail address. Use your own .com and then just have it forward. GoDaddy makes forwarding these .coms super crazy easy. Or, for example, like our jblive.fm domain and jblive.am. All I did is go over to GoDaddy, I registered those super quick, and then I log into the administration panel, and within just like four or five clicks, you have a forwarder setup that you can change anytime on demand. It's awesome, too, because you can do permanent redirects, you can do temporary redirects. They let you control all of that with a very simple-to-use interface. So you can get a lot of value out of a .com without having to have a server to point it out, without having to have a blog or anything like that. You can just have it go anywhere on the internet you want very quickly. GoDaddy makes that super easy. And now for $2.49, I don't know how you're ever going to beat that deal. Use our code CODER249 when you check out over at GoDaddy.com. And thanks to GoDaddy for sponsoring the CODA radio program. So I have been, you know, going through a life change when I had a new child come aboard. And uh, my wife also has been um, resting. Now, she's still she's still recovering. She's doing a lot better. She's up and about more these days. But for the first, you know, oh, five, five, six, seven days... She basically really wasn't getting out of bed very much, right? So we have two younger, uh, we have a we have a four year old and a two and a half year old, right? So they are they are very active children, and so kind of trying to manage my business and these shows. And the unique the new, unique thing about production work is I have very hard deadlines, right? We go live at nine o'clock on a Monday, and if if the kids haven't eaten breakfast by nine o'clock and they're still hungry, well, I still am going live at nine o'clock or we miss the show and then you miss your meeting. You know, it's like this whole chain of events. The show gets published late. People can't download it for their commute. Then I get thousands of emails. I mean, it's like this massive chain of events that happens. So it's a very hard thing. And I have kind of I, I have more of this clocking d- uh, deadline, cl- ticking deadline clock than a lot of people, I think, do that are not necessarily in a production line. Now you have deadlines with clients and things like that, too. So right. it's been a very interesting couple of weeks for me. And what I've kind of discovered is fundamentally when you're in the home and I think you have the opposite problem. But when I'm in the home, fundamentally, I'm available to the family because things come up in a household where you just need extra help, like the daughter poops in the bathtub, right? Well, it's not like I can, I'm, I'm going to be sitting down here listening to that and not helping out, right? right? So it's kind of like one of these things where if I'm not out of the house, I'm not really at work. And that's a 
that's a big problem because my type of work with editing or motion graphics or even show research, it all revolves around having a lot of focus and a lot of dedicated time to get it done. And, you know, frequent interruptions can be a detriment to that. Then the, then the product suffers from that as well. So right. this is a big struggle for me right now. And I know you kind of have, you kind of come out in a different direction where uh, you're kind of, you're kind of looking at it from a different perspective. Tell me about yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I have a bit of that problem too, but I, I think it's since I don't have the three kids, it's uh, you know less severe on my end. Uh, I have, but you're right. I have kind of the opposite problem, in that, you know, I'm pretty public that I work from my house generally, and I've noticed that what's happened, particularly in this last year, is a lot of clients, especially those who might be in California or. You know, Colorado or different time zones don't seem to to get that that even though I work from my house, it doesn't mean I'm in the office twenty twenty four seven, right? Um, for instance, it's not super uncommon for someone to try to call me at ten thirty at night. Now, unlike most devs, I'm actually a morning person. I don't like to work late. In fact, I like to knock off around four or three, um, but I'm up at five or six. And it, it, you know, in, in in the in the cases where there's a time zone difference, it's a little more understandable. You know, I often accidentally call people when it's too early because mm -hmm. if they're on the West Coast, I mean that that kind of thing is is not a big deal. Yeah, I was gonna say, I you know, as a West Coaster, I my co my clients that I had on the East Coast would call you at four in the morning because to them, yeah, or or the yeah. email at seven fifty five saying, "Why haven't you responded to my emails yet?" It's like actually, and, I just... you know, and, and I've done that kind of thing too, and and those kind of things are generally accidents. Yeah. Uh, but and, yeah, and you try to my, you try to give them time time zone forgiveness. Most of my clients aren't on the West Coast, or traditionally aren't, right? Um, I mean, yes, I'm finishing up a big project that is based on the West Coast, but you know, taken as a whole for the last X years, it's almost been all New York, right? All East Coast or England. So even even further into the, uh, they're ahead of us. What three hours? Five hours? Uh, no, they're they're like uh, they're like they? uh, six. No, let me see. Well, they're three ahead of me, and I'm. So it's nine a.m. where I'm at right yeah. now. It's four p.m. where they're at right now. Four thirty okay, so p.m. They're four hours ahead of me. Yeah. Okay. And it, it's kind of weird because, you know, what happens is, I'm up in the morning, and I understand this tech. Nobody else is up, basically. And a lot of folks are working at night, and they're calling me at night, which is frustrating. We're getting in this weird situation where also, you know, the family doesn't quite like it if I take a phone call past like six o'clock. Right? right, right, yep. Especially if we're watching a movie or eating dinner or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I don't blame them. You know, I just had a situation over the weekend where I kept getting phone calls and my uh, in-laws were over. Uh, obviously, the, the lady did not like that. And to be honest, she's right. You know, it's Sunday. Right. Think about it. If you had a lawyer and you called him on Sunday, he'd probably charge you triple. Right. Just for pissing him off. Right. <laughs> and, I, and I wrote a post about this about I think it was six months to a year ago. Kind of like it's it's weird how, you know, we'll call them business types, feel they can call on devs and, and IT folks whenever, but they would they wouldn't dare treat their attorney the same way even in the tone or the way they set deadlines. Do you think it's because the role of the IT or maybe the developer is more critical to the function of the business? You know, I think there's been this weird movement with some independent developers to treat, you know, a lawyer will never call you a customer. He'll call you a client, right? Right, right. And I think there's a big difference between a client and a customer. Um, and that's why, you know... Customer is always right, but a client you're advising. Well, a client's coming to you for your expertise, right. so it's more of an advisor situation. Yeah, where yeah. You're not you're not hired help, and sometimes you have to tell them something they don't want to hear. Whereas a customer, right. they're generally always right, and you always want to tell them what they want to hear. And I've been noticing, particularly in the Rails community, client is becoming a dirty word. Mm, gosh, really? God, I think that's too bad. I think it's a better relationship. I think well, it's a stronger. I think it's, yeah, you know, I don't have customers. Period. Um, except the people who buy my apps directly. And frankly, you know, there's a reason for that in that if someone comes to you, they don't know how to develop this thing, they can't always be right. In fact, they're often wrong. Uh, for instance, let's run our big web scale app on Go, uh, not GoDaddy, but any shared hosting. 
right? Get a GoDaddy VPS, get a server, get Azure, get something like that. Where I feel like this new shift into, not to say you shouldn't have some sort of, you know, client service and, and, you know, I'm very polite, very nice. Oh, right. That's part of the client relationship is being respectful. Right. It, of course, it's, it's, but it's a mutual respect. And, right. I, and I think that's where we're starting, where this movement is starting to get a little. So do you think because you work at home, they look at that as sort of like, well, it's his lifestyle business. And part of the lifestyle is taking calls at any time. You know, I don't know. It, I can tell you this is a new development. Or, I mean, there was always been people who didn't get boundaries, and that's okay. But I'm noticing 2013 in particular, this has been a, a real problem. And I don't know if it's just... I think it's the economy, but that's just me. I think people maybe it's think, the economy. They think wanna, people want more for their dollar. Right. The problem is you're not getting more for your dollar, right? I mean, if you, if you contract out 20 hours, you're getting 20 hours. I don't care what 20 hours those are. So if you call me, if you want to exhaust them all by calling me at 10, 10 at night, you know, it, it still counts. And, it, you know, I, li- I like the lawyer analogy because let, let's say, you know, Chris, we both run businesses. Let's say you had needed something really badly or you felt like you needed it badly, right? You were nervous, you were anxious, whatever. Would you call your lawyer and be like, buddy, I really need this. Come on, man, get her done. Like, you know, let's, let's do it. Silicon Valley style, all nighters. We've got to, got to ship. W- would you actually say that to an attorney? And do you, what, I don't what do you think, think so. The, I mean, I'd have to be, I would have to be, right. I would have to be having a nervous breakdown. I mean, for before I then, do that. What would your attorney's re- reply be? I, I probably wouldn't even get to the attorney. I'd probably just get his, his secretary. Right, his secretary would tell you, <laughs> he'll get to it, calm right. down. It's on his schedule. He'll get to right. it on 9 a.m. when he gets in. Because, right. not to be a jerk, but, and, and, I, and I'm just as bad with my attorney. You know, I got that patent. Uh, the patent threat. Me, to me, you know, Pearl Harbor just happened, right? Like, sneak attack. I'm mm-hmm. losing my mind. He's like, yeah, don't worry about it. I'll look at this next week. Sometimes when you're not an expert in the field, things seem really, really severe when they're not. Totally, totally, yeah. So you, you know, so uh, so Derwiz is, takes the perspective of somebody who primarily writes for customers. You write software and then sells directly. Right. Uh, and... So, you know, he doesn't get brought into the business side of it, I guess, as much there where he actually is developing in-house. But he says, uh, he says it could be different in his dev world. We don't consult. We write and sell software products. We offer support, yes, but not by the hour. And I wonder, is it possibly this by the hour thing? People figure, well, if if it's by the hour, then it's just a tap. When I flip the tap, I'm paying, but I get access. And when I'm done, I turn it off. So one thing I've had is I have people who like to prepay hours, sure, which that's, is that's, that's totally great. cool. With. That's great and bad, but great usually. But, but, but they forget that consulting is part of that. Oh, so yeah. So if they want to pull me into a meeting that I probably don't need to go to, that's awesome. But if you have someone, maybe a PM who's grandstanding. So when you, I mean, I know, so this like particularly is happening with yeah. a very long standing contract, right? It's not any one contract. It's been this last year. Have you and had do you feel like you have established up front when you've done the when you've met the, when you've met them and set up the relationship? Do you feel like boundaries were established clearly? I feel like it happens with longer contracts more. Yeah. I feel like once you hit that four to five, even six month mark, people get very comfortable. Comfortable. Yeah. Right. That's what I was wondering. And just to, was, yeah. just to reply in the chat room. The Pearl Harbor references, from my perspective, it was like a sneak attack, right? It was very severe. From my lawyer's perspective, he laughed, wrote a one-page letter, and I never heard from them again. <laughs> it, so it's a, a point-of-view type of thing. See, I think you and I are coming up against the same thing, and that is the the aspect, the element of working from home sets an expectation that I believe goes deeper than... Um, than uh, like than boundaries that can be set up in just like a business relationship because I think people I think the way it works is people uh, uh, come to conclusions without even really filtering it through the normal processes. Well, he's at home. I'll just call him. I I also feel like, and and I don't know if this is too much conjecture, but I feel like people almost treat you less professional if you work out of your house. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do. And I know there's probably an age component to this because since I'm I'm somewhat significantly younger than most of my clients. But it, it's strange. Like 
I almost feel like if there was an office and there was a phone in the office and you called that phone and if it didn't answer, it went to voicemail. And that was always the way things were. People would never, you know, it would never be an issue. But what I find is happening is, you know, maybe once in a while I did answer the after hours calls. And then this strange expectation gets set. Yeah. And then when I don't answer the call, you know, for lack of a better term, we have a, you know, a pissing contest. Well, and let's be honest. I mean, does it sometimes happen that maybe you're a little more enthusiastic about the client early on? So you're more likely to answer their call. And then as things sort of stabilize and mature, I I don't even think it's enthusiasm. It's usually I'm trying to get them to relax, right? You know, because most of them, it's a new field for them, mobile. And I have a lot of questions, and I'm just trying to get them to calm down. And let them know nervous. that, yeah, it's, it's under control. It's under we got control. it handled. Yeah. It's good. Don't worry about it. You know, but in, in particular, it, it really came to a head this last week with the Apple outage. Because, you know, you're getting those phone calls, and the only answer you have is, I don't know. Right? I don't know when we'll be able to make new keys. I don't know when any of this is going to work again. Um, which no one wants to hear. It's it's strange because, you know, in my mind, an office is just a sunk cost, even a small one, even like a co- a uh, co co working. Well, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, I've built sort of my, I mean, I've built a lot of what I a lot of what I do is possible because I don't pay like a thousand dollars a month yeah. to be somewhere. I do it out of my house. And, you know, I kind of like what Dirwa says, and I'm going to quote him. So apologies if you don't like being quoted. Uh, if you do magic for a customer working late, etc., customer will then expect magic. And this is actually something that me and you have both talked about when we we're replacing other contractors. And I recently had a situation like this. Well, you know, your predecessor never had these problems. My right. was because my predecessor worked all night and all weekend and every burned week, themselves out, which I'm simply not going to do. And, and why are they not here right. now? Why am I here and not them? Because he burned out, right? Mm-hmm. And and that's and I think I I do think that this is my fault, but I also think. You know, the aspects that you brought up about family life and even just the mindset of your house being your office. You know, I've, we were watching a movie last night, and what did I do? I picked up my MacBook, and I caught up on some emails and letters I had to write. Right, I always have that. I would, But I feel like I'd have that temptation if I had an office in my house or not. I feel like I would, but I can't remember a time where I took a day off, even a Saturday or a Sunday, and I didn't work in some fashion. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, for for now, for me, and I guess forever. I guess the main point of discussion <laughs> since be, high school. You know, we have a lot of technology now that allows remote working and virtual working. Yeah, which I think is great for a client consultant perspective. But I'm not wondering if for a a personal life balance perspective, you know, do you feel that there is a dollar amount where it just makes sense to to not work from home? Right. So, is there a is there a number where if it's below that number to get an office that you would do it? Oh, well, I mean, I mean, you know, if it's just a few hundred dollars a month, that kind of thing. A realistic number. Uh, well, my wife and I are talking about an unrealistic number right now. So I have a townhouse that I own that I rent out. So, yeah, I mean, something like that might be perfect. But it's, you know, it's it's expensive a month. So I mean, it's one of those things where we can't really afford it, but current situation isn't working so well for either one of us. Yeah, and I'm I'm finding myself very much in the same same I mean, obviously less with the kids, but you know, it's it's funny because I used to wonder why a lot of people went into co co working. And now, you know, more and more I I found myself going to a local coffee shop or to Barnes and Noble or to someplace like that. For you, is it the mindset change, or do you feel like do you feel like if you were at an office that and you had a phone number at this office and you had an address and you did business out of this office that the clients would sort of recognize your office hours more? Is that what you? Would I, I think that's what it is. And I also so there's another perspective to this, and I don't think it's such a big secret that I have a game in development, and I have tried to work with a number of graphics designers, um, two of which have been good, but they're super far remote, and you know, kind of trying to get some more junior help. And it might be a feeling me, I cannot manage um, that type of position without physically sitting over them. 
developers, I'm fine remotely, but you know, the whole design thing, they, they, there's been several cases where we've tried people out and they've gone on tangents that were totally not what we were looking for. And is the problem they go away for a few days and they come back and like, oh, so you just spent Well, they days? come back with like a $500 bill, right? And I'm livid, but technically they did the work and I understand I can't stiff them, but what they've given me is not what I wanted. And I'm getting to the point where, well, you know, we want to ship this game the consulting company has some real good reasons to want an office, right? Why not bring everything into one space? Yeah, that just means that you have this this dollar amount that you have to cover every single month. That's the problem. There's this overhead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. See, the, the the flip side, the reason why, the other thing I was thinking about the townhouse is I, sooner than later, would like to, hopefully, bef- you know, before this time next year, have one or two people working for the company. Um, not necessarily full time, but uh, I'd like them to have maybe a space that they could either share or work out of. Um, <clears throat> so th- th- there's there's that challenge too, because when I have, for example, guests or uh, people want to come and watch a show, they have to come into my house and then they have to come into my right. garage and then they have to sit in my garage and watch me do a show. Um, and you know we we so we kind of we kind of keep it to a minimum. We very rarely have people in studio while we're doing a show just because of that. And that'd be something else I'd like to, so I feel like that would be changed. But at the same time, I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, if I could make the work-life balance thing work here at my house, may- maybe then, uh, you know, I mean, that just is more, that's more money that I can spend on something for the kids or a, a new new gadget or something like that. and Or invest in hardware for the company. You know, it's money that I could turn yep. around and put back into the business. At, at, and, and the problem is, is, you know, it, the, the technology that we have today the other thing that I really get hung up on, it fundamentally enables this new type of business that isn't bound to a, a, a building. It is, it's- so, so that's the problem. With all the tools to do development remotely, I really do feel like, <laughs> you know, the office really is a waste, right, at some level. Yeah. And especially as, you know, Bear 454, which is an interesting name, is wondering why can't I just turn the phone off? Problem is, it's not that I can't hit the off button, right? It's that there's this weird expectation among pe- certain people that they just, you know, yes, it goes to voicemail, but then they're upset the next day. Yeah, you know, I've, I've sort of, I've come to an unpopular conclusion. I think most people think it's probably an asshole thing, but I just think it's it's just practical. And so I I've struggled with email over the years. And now bit messages and now tweets and now G plus threads. And, and, uh, my, a, a lot of times I, I know that when people email me, there is an expectation of an action on my part, either a reply right. or, uh, you know, sometimes more than that. Um, and sometimes people have in depth questions and I have just simply taken the position of, I will read as much email in a day that I can reasonably get to. I have, Really, it does bother me more often than it should, but for the most part, come to peace with the fact that there are literally thousands of emails in my inbox, maybe maybe, maybe close to 5,000 unread emails in my inbox from the last year alone. And I just have come to peace with that. And I know that in there, there's expectations, there's things I need to reply to, but I, I can only just manage as much as I can manage. So it's weird. I, I am very bad at replying to personal email but for uh, work email I, I pretty much reply to every, anything and I don't yeah I try to I don't mind email so much so that's where it gets a little strange you know I, I will certainly shoot you back a fast email yeah but the expectation of let's get this done quote now right something's you know indefinite quotes urgent um You know, it, it might just be, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it might just be an issue of, well, certain types of work are easier done in an office. Um, I mean, certainly the graphic stuff has been difficult because there's a little too much of a black box there. You don't really feel like you've had focus problems at home working from home? A little, but the problem is most of the day I'm alone. It. it it can be hard when people show up. You know, yeah, that's for sure. 
I mean, not I mean, only that, that can definitely screw you up for a day. in the chat. You know, it also maybe maybe there's an expectation out there from business owners that when they hire the small little guy, one of the perks of hiring the little guys, they don't have to go through the office hour bureaucracy type big business stuff that they get direct access to the person, and that's why we went with the little guy. That's part of the perk of hiring the independent guy. Is this just maybe what the business has turned into? It, it may be, and what's interesting is I'm, you know, we, we've kind of opened the kimono a little bit on the show. I'm pretty hard on the way my contracts are. Um, it basically is what it is. Yeah, on this one facet, I've been super flexible, and I think it's probably an area where I could have been more flexible in other places without a problem, but I chose to be flexible here, and it, it, it's totally the wrong place to be flexible. Yeah. Because what I feel like the problem is is that you have actual deliverables that are in the contract, and then when you do these little things for people, they start to feel, you know, you get in these weird discussions about value and performance when it has nothing to do with what you're contracted to do, right? You didn't take a phone call at 11 at night. So, and, you know, it, it may just be the economy. This may just be a game that businesses are playing right now. And to be fair, I, I can drop a contract and, and be okay. Yeah. I worry more for this, the person just starting out freelancing, right? Like, the, the truth is I'm a fairly conservative guy with money. I mean, I could, you know, I, I could get p pissed and tell someone to go bang off without much of a problem. But I'm wondering for the guys who just left their jobs and are just freelancing, are they answering the phone? Like, are they answering their phone at two in the morning? Is that an expectation that they they've just internalized? Hmm. I'd, be, I'd be curious to have people send us in some some of their thoughts. I know that you know it's something that I've always struggled with when I was a contractor. Especially if in you know certain lines of business, they need to contact you. Need to kind of be available in case of emergencies. So that's just, for dev, you don't need to be available for an emergency, right? Right, but as an IT, because realistically, even if there's something out in the store that you've contacted yeah. us to change, yeah, we're not going to get it done in less than two weeks minimum, right? Like, right. Yeah, yeah. It, no, but like so for me, you know, if the server's down, you got to call Chris. So I, I can't. I, I, I don't really I, have the option. I didn't ever have the option of turning off the phone. Well, I think those cases are special cases, and I'm sure you charge a maintenance fee. Or emergency fee, yeah. Or emergency fee, right. Mm -hmm. I, I just feel like... I don't know. I, I've just... Re, you know, this last year, I've seen so many devs get burned out with this kind of thing. And I guess I'm just being a little protective of myself, thinking, okay, I don't want to burn out like that, right? Um, so what could I do to not have this happen? Yeah, burnout is something I'm feeling like I'm struggling with just because of the crazy the life kids. situation right now. Yeah, it's hard to push yourself when you're burning out, even and though you, know, it, you have to. It's funny we've been talking about this for about forty minutes. Yeah, I know exactly what me and probably most listeners to the show will do. They will look for co-location or not co-location, co-working and offices. Talk to the managers of these places. Look at the sticker price and then just say, you know what, screw it. Yeah. Right. Right. And maybe there is a simpler solution. I mean, I like Pythoneer. You have to hit where it hurts. Six dollar signs. Maybe you, could, you know, maybe it's just charging for every phone call. Yeah, it sounds like then you're gonna, you know, you become. But that's a, a very ho that's very hostile. Right? And that's, well, also you're not. Then you become less competitive. Well, so here's the other thing: as a dev, you're competing, especially for small projects. You're really not competing with other people. Oh, then you have you more know, flexibility. Yeah, you could charge more. Your biggest competitor is that the guy goes overseas, right? I mean, you know, it, it's rare for me to lose a project to a to a domestic competitor. It's usually, oh, well, these guys are a third of your price. But won't that just be a more of a problem if you're charging for every phone call? Right, but when, I mean, when an offshore company is charging fifteen dollars an hour, there, there's nothing you can do. Yeah. With that. I mean, there's okay, sure. Yeah. If you're a thousand dollars different than the guy two towns over, that's fine. But yeah, yeah. you know, usually you lose. In my experience, bidding on projects, you lose a project because you know we have a few more minutes. Actually, there, I have a war story. Can I tell it in a few minutes? Yeah, totally. I actually. Um, what was it? I had a client come to me, said he had a developer that was based out of Pennsylvania. I said, awesome, let's set this up. 
So I set up the server. We got everything going. I was actually doing backend, which was a rarity for me. And I'm noticing all the traffic to the API is coming from India. And I didn't say anything at first. I kind of, you know, I kind of said, well, there's been traffic. It's been unusual. So the client tells me, oh, this guy has been pretty good. But, you know, he's, he can never answer a question when I call him. He always has to call me back the next day. Hmm. Interesting. So I show the client the logs. Would you believe that this guy was straight pretending to do the work and subcontracting it overseas for a third of the rate he was charging? Really? Yeah. And what, and usually, and we've talked about the whole subcontracting, usually the reason someone will pay a higher rate domestically, and domestically it can be whatever company uh, country you happen to live in, is because they don't want it sent overseas, right? Uh, particularly if your customer's Canadian or British, they actually have different laws about data privacy. Hmm. So oftentimes they can't ship it overseas. Yeah, I, just, I worked uh, for a company that did that a little bit. We were an IT consulting company, but when the when the company would need development work done, they would claim that it was them, the the, the contractor company, but they would just outsource it to India. They just had they just had a company that they just worked with. They had this, they had like a contract or something established. The company that I worked for did. So anytime a client said, "Yeah, we need development work," that way they could advertise when they go in there. Hi, we're such and such, and we do your IT consulting. And if you need a little development work, we can take care of that too. We have in-house developers, but they weren't really in-house. They and, had and that's, yeah, in-house and that's relationships, a- and then that's what they would. That's kind of what the thing they would dance around. Say these are in-house developers. In a sense, we work with them. We have people in-house who are assigned to work with those developers. <laughs> and and those, those are the guys that really, you know, you, if you're bidding on a project, that you're going to lose the project to. Yeah. And then, of course, you know what kind of quality you're going to get. Right. And then you'll, the guy will call you back in six months. So, Yeah, that's true. That's true. And he'll say, get it out of here. Get it out of here. And he might yeah. also say, it's a negative in the freedom dimension. You know, I wonder how RMS balances work in life. Um, I don't know if that man does. I don't know if he does. But- I it is a it is a challenge. So my my vision potentially is I'm hoping to maybe strike an equal balance. Right now I have one bay of the garage, right, for my studio. Right. I'm thinking about um launching an attack on the rest of the garage and taking over all of the garage and just converting it into So is this like are you, were you inspired by island hopping? Is this uh... <clears throat> Um by you know nations, by I'm I'm empire building basically in my garage is uh, what I take my in, um, inspiration from. So I was, I'm was, i potentially considering that. And then when I'm out in the garage, I'm at work. And when I come in, I'm not at work anymore. So I may may put up proper doors to my home office. Right now, there's these little sliding things. I, I, that might work. problem is, then what do I do with all the crap in my garage? See, it's not really a solvable yeah. problem. because you know. Yeah, that's the other thing. I don't... It's difficult, Chris. Yeah, I, think for I, me, I hope the listeners haven't been too bored because I know many of them are, are working on W twos, and this doesn't really apply. But well, I, you know what though? Maybe some of them hate those W twos, and they've thought about quitting and going off on their own. This is something they'll have to struggle with. And I didn't think it'd actually be a problem, really. You know, I, I mean, I know that sounds ridiculous, but thinking about it a while ago, so it ago, hasn't been a problem for four years, and all of a sudden it is. Yeah, and it, right. it's but it's like real. It's a real problem now because it's like, oh, so I've really got to get this figured out a lot faster than I thought I did, and I might be having to take the crazy jump of actually moving into a townhouse. What is it? I don't craziness. know. I don't know what the Washington real estate market's like, but in New Jersey, you'd be far better off renting an office financially and renting your townhouse to a, a family or something. Yeah, I mean it's about the same I'd pay, I'd pay for an office space, and since oh, and then, and then I'm, instead of paying rent, I'm paying on a place that I own. True, true. But it you know it would it would involve probably damaging it in a way that it would not make the resale value so great because I'd have to drill holes and run wiring and install lighting and install right. sound insulation, which is sticky and it's you know I mean it would be a conversion process. And the other problem is that. See that this is it's not just getting the office space. There's also then the expense of setting up the office space, or in my case, setting up studio and office space. It just I mean, when I think about it from that perspective, it just almost doesn't seem achievable. But at the same time, I feel like I'm up against a wall where if I don't if I don't take action soon, um, you know, I'm gonna either have family problems or I'm gonna have business problems. And that's serious. So I gotta get something figured out. That's my position. So I don't know. We'll see uh, what happens. Actually, I have breaking news. Can we take another minute? Yeah. Well, hold on a second. I got something special for you. 
What is it? I just got um, an email from Apple, and I thought it said they were back up, but it says they will be back up this week. <laughs> Crap. So you had to redo all your... Uh, all your no, t- I can't. So I got a double whammy, and I and maybe this we should go into this because it's a little weird Okay. doing Apple development. All right. Some people weren't as badly hurt as I was because y- you get your certificate every year with your dev program. It's your personal certificate, right? Yeah, yeah. So like there's one that says Michael Dominic Fingertip Tech Inc. Blah blah blah. I need that certificate for all of my clients, no matter what, to do a test build. That expires once a year. It expired on July third, the day they went down. That is some bad timing. Right. So even though they've brought up part of the service, I still can't regenerate my my base certificate. Wow. <sighs> And the system still says it's expired. So if I, you know, I'm on my Mac right now. If I were to plug in my iPhone and be like, okay, let's compile this to the phone. Bam. No. Now what they've done is, so the majority of people who didn't have that happen are more or less back in business. But not the whole, then this is just off the email I just got on the air. They are working to bring everything up by this week. But right now, a few things aren't up. This is uh, this is the brave new world we have entered, isn't it? Yeah. So the thing that's still down is the Xcode automatic um, search uh, configuration. Computer, what happened? What's frustrating is I generated my cert originally through Xcode, and for some reason on iTunes Connect, I can't manually regenerate it. I, it says go use Xcode, <sighs> which is not working yet because that part of the service is down. So it's now the situation is even worse, right? Because some people can actually be more productive than me. At, at this very second. But I can't. Oh, man. Yeah, so I'm looking. I'm looking at their state status page. So out of 15 services, four are still down. So that's not terrible, but the ones that are down are pretty significant, right? Enrollments and renewals, which I need. Tech support, the entire member center, and the Xcode conf- certificate configuration service. And we're going on week two of the savage. For yeah, me. that's bad. That's so I, I can only imagine my call right after this is going to be awful. It's it's going to be one of those, you know, especially with a contract ending, people sometimes get worried that you might just slack off towards the end. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's just going to be. Well, I mean, at least you have this to say. Look, you know, at least you can say they've given me this yeah. update. But yeah, yeah, it's it's really. They need to rethink how they're doing things. If if one service going down can demolish someone like this, well, this is the this is a serious problem with them having central control. Yeah, yeah. right. I mean, if this if you were releasing for the Windows platform, obviously, I mean, I'm not talking Windows Phone or releasing for the Linux desktop or the Mac desktop, not through their store, this could never happen to you. This literally none of this could have happened to you. Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't even know what to say about this. It's one of those situations where, you know, they're not going to change the system. Oh yeah, no, they're just going to try to improve the infrastructure every time right. it happens. But, I, I, what's funny is I found myself in these, incredibly uncomfortable meetings, actually having to defend Apple as though it were my system. Mm-hmm. But the problem is everybody, you know. They ask that question, okay, so when's it going to be back up? Well, I don't know. And, you know, I really thought it would be up today. And that's not very good. No, it's... Yeah. it. Uh, Apple is going through a tough time right now, aren't they? Did you see that the uh, reports are now, too, that their, their tablet market share has slipped to 32%? That's astonishing. I know they're losing... Uh, well. So, I I think, and I was very against this, but I I think the folks who said the Android iOS thing is going to be like the Windows Mac thing, I I think they might actually turn out to be right in the end. It does make sense if you have hundreds, or I guess maybe not hundreds, well, of phones maybe, but if you have dozens of different tablets versus one manufacturer's tablet. To to be fair, the only Android tablet that actually does well is the Nexus 7, but 
Yeah, and Samsung's got and, it. And maybe the Kindle Fire, if that counts. Well, you know who really did? You know who just really can't stop selling things is Samsung. They had a 277% increase in the last year in their tablet market share. Asus had 120%, Lenovo you know, 313. I, I, I played with, uh, what is the Samsung Galaxy 8 or Galaxy Tab 8? You know what this is? This They're also counting uh, some of those convertible laptops as tablets. So they're, oh, they're, is, that, oh, is that how they're counting? They're widening okay. the tablet uh, definition, but still the majority of the bulk went to Samsung. Well, it's funny, Dell just sent me a, because uh, I have a business account with them, they just sent me a catalog, very few desktops in that catalog. And from Dell? Of, from Dell? From Dell, from Dell Computer. What, what, what were they selling? A lot of touch laptops. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I mean, Windows 8 selling so well, it makes sense to me. All I have to say is that if I was doing Windows apps, I wouldn't have this freaking problem. Yeah, it is really a thing. Um, now, you, you can't really necessarily make the same claim about Android, though they do seem to kind of figure out how to run infrastructure a little better. Uh, but it could still happen, I suppose, over at Google. Well, I, I think what's happening is that you get, um, you know, there, there were about three articles posted last week about iOS versus Android development, and there are trade-offs. You know, and I think I'm a little biased right now, considering for the last two weeks I've basically had to, what is the expression, eat crow? <laughs> because of Apple, but yeah. in general, as long as they're not having some catastrophic event, it's a much easier path on iOS because there's one way to do things, and that's basically it. Yeah, and I know that's not true, but there's a preferred way. How about we say it like that? So you and I are wrapping up the episode, but we don't really have a conclusion to our woes. We kind of—it's I guess it's, it, it's funny. I came in here thinking I'm going to go get an office for for January, and now I'm coming out thinking I don't think I am. I kind of am too. I, I kind of yeah. came into this thinking, all right, we're gonna we're gonna do that townhouse thing, and now I'm thinking maybe I should do the garage thing. When I just think about the money, and you think right. about you never know what's going to happen in the economy, and then you also think about the flexibility it gives you. There's so many advantages to working from home. It's just. It's like the further you know what it is is the more the business grows the 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 the, the um the more the strain is on that balance right the it, more it's a bigger deal if you miss something the more it's the more you have important meetings the more phone calls you're getting uh, and it just becomes it, the problem sort of grows and then something happens in your life like you know all of your clients applications can't be updated or your wife has your third child and like it you realize oh wow i've been i've been i've been walking this tightrope a lot tighter than i actually realized and anything that upset that really throws things into this massive unbalance it's funny though cuz i'm thinking from both our perspectives you know in, in a in a year or even 6 months when when abigail right little abigail uh, uh, annabelle is the new one annabelle abigail. i'm sorry no, we abigail, abigail is my second daughter it's okay They're, i got so many of them i get them confused too uh, when she's a little older, I'm wondering if the pressure won't be off of you a little bit. Like, I'm thinking, you know, in a month, okay, assuming they're back up in a month, in a month when they've been up for a few weeks and this isn't a problem anymore. Right. Will Will life kind we'll, of settle we'll, back? Well, we'll things just, you know. I disagree. I don't think so. Don't I think, think what will. I think what it is is you and I became comfortable at a new level of strain. And the reason why we're so frayed right now is because we've actually been we've actually been pushing to the limit for a while and we just haven't acknowledged it to ourselves because it's a very uncomfortable problem to have to deal with without a very good answer. And so I think you and I have sort of been just sort of ignoring this this tenuous situation and anything else can happen down the road. You could have another car accident, there could be another storm. Right. You know, anything could happen, and well, it's going to. I mean, there there have been a number of external stresses for me. A car accident, though no one was hurt, is still a big yeah. deal, right? It's still a problem. Yeah. Like, no, I think it still shows us what this is. Was the warning shot? I think yeah. because you're right. Both these situations, Angela's. You know, she's recovering more and more every day, so she's going to take on more of that. Um, you know, I, 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 I will. You know, we'll figure out a new balance, a new routine, and a lot of things will settle in. And you're right; it will get better. But I think this was the warning shot. This was us. This is sort of our, here's your opportunity to start making the change before it really gets out of hand. And so now we just have to figure you, out what, what it is. What change are you, that's right. So what change are you going to make? I don't know. Because I don't think it's worth $1,000 a month. Yeah. Still. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And right. see, for me, not only would it be $1,000 a month, but it'd also be probably several thousand, maybe five, ten thousand $10,000, right. maybe even more to get it up and running. So it'd be a huge investment. Whereas maybe I could get away with only, you know, a few hundred dollars if I move out into my garage. Because I'd have to move out to make it a studio too, so I mean maybe I go that route and try to figure it out. But you know now I know I have to do something at least. I think that's at least a good conclusion. 
Yeah, I think that's where I am too. I, I know I have to do something, but the monetary pain of, of, um, of, you know, of the straight office space is probably not worth it. Yeah, but it's like, um, I also at the same time, I am, uh, uh, what, it, what it really fundamentally boils down to is I am now becoming the barrier to me to, to growing the network and to earning more revenue and, uh, you know, taking and getting all of the things done that I want to get done. I have so many projects for the network that I want to accomplish before the end of the year. And I'm a huge part of the reason why they're not getting done because I'm not getting this addressed. And so in order for me to continue on and make things even better, I've got to solve this problem. So it's just time to hunker down. You know, it's funny. I've been rebuilding a lot of infrastructure things in the network, like my my storage array, my network connectivity, my, my, the wireless, because a lot of the uh, control equipment is on Wi-Fi. I mean, you know, I've been reinvesting in the last three months in all of this infrastructure equipment. And now I need to invest in sort of the business side of things for a little while. And it's hard for me to do that because honestly, the only thing I want to do is make shows. You know, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't want to spend time on that. I'd rather just pretend like that problem doesn't exist and just make more shows. Yeah. I think we should drop it there. All um, right. We do have a more Cody topic that was supposed to be for this week, but it's going to be for next week. There you go. And of course, there's lots of opportunity for more feedback. So email us, you guys, coderadio at jupiterbroadcasting.com or pop that contact link at the top of our website. Or don't forget, we've got that subreddit coderadio.reddit.com where I put a link to every episode where you can give us feedback. Mr. Dominic, where should people find you throughout the week? They can find me at dominicm.com That's powerful, man. That's real powerful. Alright, everyone, don't forget the Coder Radio program is live on Mondays at 9 a.m. Pacific noon Eastern over at jblive.tv and jblive.info for the audio. You can subscribe to get our show weekly and we always appreciate a comment or a rating in the iTunes store. It helps discovery. Alright, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in this week's episode of Coder Radio. We'll see you right back here next week.